Decorating Pages is a podcast dedicated to taking you behind the scenes of the designs of your favorite TV shows and films. Each episode, I'll be sharing design stories from some of Hollywood's most famous sets, interviews from set decorators, production designers, directors, and actors about creating the look of TV and film, about their design inspirations, and stories that take sets from page to screen. Hello, and welcome to Decorating Pages. I'm your host, Kim Wanup. It's quiet. It's quiet over here on this western front, I would have to say, of uh, Los Angeles and working. Um, I had said previously that I just started up with a couple friends, a little film group. Oh, my dog left the room. He's bored. Um, and uh, there was... Uh, seven of us at this uh, meeting and only one of us was working and it was a commercial. So it's a little um, scary, I think. I then went the other night to the For All Mankind for your consideration for Emmys and was talking to an editor and um, he also said that uh, even on the editing side in post-production, it's a little quiet. So... Hope everybody has time to listen to this podcast instead. (laughs) Since we all have a little time off, uh, yeah. I I haven't been listening to my audiobooks, um, but I did just finally start. David Smith, who was on a couple episodes ago, had recommended David Milch's autobiography called Life's Work. And I'm only about a half hour into it, but it's pretty good. He does the prologue. Um, in his own voice and you can hear him and that that voice and he's just kind of struggling so the rest of the book is narrated um, by someone else who does kind of sound like him though so I I'm I'm buckled in and ready to dive into that I just love David Milch's work as a writer and I just think he's uh was amazing and um so that's my audio book and I you know I haven't I didn't say it but I was nominated um as the um set decorator peer group governor for the um television academy so I'm starting in my first year of that and so far it's so interesting to see how this organization really runs and how much passion and effort the people who work there put into the Emmys and these board meetings and the governor meetings and then the peer group meetings. It's a lot of meetings, <laughs> but I like it. And there's a lot in store. It is the Emmy's 75th anniversary this year, so it should be a fun one. And tons and tons of for your considerations uh, coming up in the next uh, two months. Uh, Emmy season is almost upon us. Voting uh, uh, submissions are open now for anyone who has a show. And then voting starts, I believe, like mid-June, June June 15th, I think. So, yeah, we're we're getting into it. And I promise you I'm going to have some good, good interviews for that. I like to try to pick the winners, as you can see with Ernestine Hipper. I, I like to try to, you know, talk to winners. I'm not going to lie. The last two weeks, I took last week off because <laughs> I've been overwhelmed with how much I have been able to do this podcast and um, I've had such great interviews coming up for you. It's going to be awesome. But what I've been watching is I went for an oldie uh, last week and started watching Private Benjamin with uh, Goldie Hawn because I had forgotten exactly what it was about. You know, she's a young woman who her you know her family solution for her is for her to get married and then her husband dies and she at a desperation of being lost in life joins the army and there is that comedy in there um Eileen oh my god now I'm gonna forget her name and I I kept watching things with her Eileen Brennan fuck I forget her name um she is in it yes Eileen Brennan that's what it is um who plays the like the colonel or the captain or whatever and just tries to make 
Private Benjamin's life a, a ma- a, like really hard, and she's fantastic in it. Um, and then I think it's Amanda Sante is like the third, yeah, the third love of her life, and then she goes down that road, and I had forgotten the ending, so it was good to see that. Um, that uh, production designer, designer Robert F. Boyle, Jeffrey Howard, and set decorator Arthur F- Arthur Parker. Right. Um, just a good old movie, I think. I think it's a good old movie. Goldie Hawn is always so cute. Um, and then I I watched Summer Rental. I'll get to that in a minute. But after I watched Summer Rental, the next movie like that Amazon gave like as a suggestion was Clue, and I never turned down Clue. Another Eileen Brennan film, which I just love. I will watch Clue a million times uh, if you let me. Um, production designer John Robert Lloyd and um, production designer Thomas no oh, set decorator Thomas Royston who did Blade Runner by the way god that the, the house in Clue is amazing and I was looking up they did some exteriors in Pasadena but it had to be a full build and everything and I just I don't know what I'm looking for every time I watch it but I love it I have always wanted that dress that Leslie Ann Warren is wearing. I just adore that dress. And even Mrs. White, um, who is, you know, just totally fantastic. And there's such good lines in it. And I don't know. I'm a dork. I just love Clue. Um, and then I was looking on T- the TCM hub on um, you know, the HBO Max and their new releases for April and this movie Scarecrow came up, which I had no idea about, but I see the thing and it's Gene Hackman. So I'm in. I love a Gene Hackman. And Al Pacino. It's like 1973 or something. And again, Eileen Brennan is in it. She's got a little part, but I got like halfway through it. It's about like two hobos on a train. I wasn't really into it, but there's some good... There's some good dialogue in there, and I, I love Gene Hackman, so that was production designed by Albert Brenner, who also did uh, 2010, The Year We Made Contact. So these, you know, just huge production designers doing all these old great movies, so phenomenal. Um, like I said, I did Summer Rental again. Um, my husband and I were actually looking for Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and it wasn't free, so one of the suggestions was Summer Rental, and he hadn't seen it, and directed by Carl Weiner, which is awesome, production designed by Peter Woolley, who did Blazing Saddles, and set decoration by Gary Marino. I, uh, it's not a great film, but it makes me laugh every time, and I love Rip Torn, and John Candy, what a sin. That's, uh, that sucks that he's not around, you know. Um... What else am I watching? Secession, like everybody else, with production designer Stephen Carter and set decoration by George Dettata Jr. Uh, Succession is like I hang on every word. It's it's just it's like it's like Veep, you know? It's like I gotta you gotta really listen or you're gonna miss something. The other one I'm watching is Perry Mason. Oh he's back. Um production designed by Keith Cunningham and set decoration by Helena Swoop. Um, I like Perry Mason. I, I I mean, I love the design of it and the the period, and I really love that actor who was in The Americans. He's always so good. I forget his name. <laughs> but um, it's good, and it's, you know, there's, it's, I feel like I'm not watching that much that's airing live, so Secession and Perry Mason are kind of my uh, what's going on this week. So, yeah. I, got, I watched a lot kind of in the last two weeks. So um, some oldies and goodies and then some fantastic new ones. So happy about that. So on this episode, I speak with production designer John L. Manahy, who over the last two decades has experience in designing sets and creating stunning visual effects for his films. Recently, he has been busy on the feature film Spinning Gold, which came out last week. It's a a biopic about the life and career of legendary music producer Neil Bogart, 
who was the co-founder of Casablanca Records. And the film is, I believe, written and directed by his son. So very um, heartwarming sort of tribute to your father. But uh, John's work on Spinning Gold perfectly captures the glitz and the glamour of the music industry of the 1970s. Everything from like Donna Summer to Gladys Knight to Kiss, uh, recreating Kiss sets. You gotta watch that. Um, just and these iconic re- recording studios in the period and concert stages. So he definitely brought the film's setting to life um, and did a wonderful job doing it. I was uh, lucky enough, I got to meet John last week after we spoke. Spinning Gold had its premiere last week at the DGA, and he attended. He said it was so awesome to see everyone's hard work on the film up on the screen. And they had a QA, and a and then they had an after party where he didn't even know, but um, a surprise guest of George Clinton came out, who was portrayed by Wiz Kafka in the movie, came out, and they were singing. I mean, how awesome is that? not as more than a rap party but like a premiere party that's awesome so um really enjoyed the film as you'll hear i really love hearing about or watching um the development of um music in the 70s and the influence and everything and he is so into this film and how he was connected to it being a musician and an artist so i hope you enjoy I feel very lucky like with you like to get to talk to people and people like giving me time to to be able to talk about our work it's yeah, it's really it's awesome great. for me yeah. to hear everything too so thank you thank you yeah. yeah um I did get I watched spinning gold I I'm my parents are huge Motown people so I grew up with a lot of Motown a lot of like that ty- that that music. So for me, the story is like fantastic. Like awesome. I'm all I'm all about it. I'm scared to death of Kiss. Still am, <laughs> but <laughs> but what a fantastic story to be a part of. And period. And like it's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, right? And for me, it was kind of a dream job. You know, uh, I. Uh, just wrote an article about um, my involvement. And, you know, the first time I heard Kiss, I was 12 years old. It was 1975, Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving. My cousin played Kiss Alive, and uh, it blew my mind. I was already listening to music um, from my older sister, Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, Motown, Diana Ross, like, the Beatles, like everything. We had a lot of music in my house. Um, And uh, I started playing guitar. I was in a band when I was 15. I moved out to California when I was 22 to pursue music, you know. Oh, this is up your alley. This is perfect. Yeah. And uh, so when I got a call basically from uh, a producer named Blythe Frank, and she's friends with Jessica Martins, who was a producer on the show. And she was looking for a production designer based in New York. So Blythe recommended me based on her work with me and also my music background. And I had a call with Tim Bogart. As soon as I read the script, I was like, this is my job. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm, this is mine. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't care what you say. Like, I'm getting this job, you know. Um, but my meeting with him, this was like post COVID. We had a Zoom call that was like three hours long. And it was, I was hired on the spot. And it was basically like my passion, my experience, and, you know, and a lot of other things. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know what, you know, you've seen uh, my IMDb or oh, anything. Oh, yeah. You have tons of credits that lend to being able to pull this off. I mean, it's not like it's your first gig. It's like, <laughs> yeah, but it was the thing is, is if you look at some of those credits, like 
the movies were really indie, low budget, even though they were union films or whatever. And my reputation is like the kind of like pull a rabbit out of a hat production designer, you Mm. know, like slim budgets, tight schedules, you know, we all have to go through it. Um, But this was like on another level, you know, this was, there were an insane amount of sets to build and it had a lot of drama. There was a lot of, do you know anything about the background of the movie at all or? No, I don't know. No, not at all. Tell me. (laughs) So, well, you know, it started, um, this was a long process for Tim Bogart. Uh, He tried a long time to get the financing to do the film. He finally got it and they started filming in Montreal in 2020 and then COVID shut them down. Mm. And so then they had a financial crisis. They lost their financing and a whole bunch of other stuff. So they basically had to reboot and they were going to, they had shot the, so the movie takes place from approximately like 1959, 1960 to 1978. And they'd shot a lot of 1960 to 1967. So I was called in to do 1967 and 1978. And they came into New York Uh, sorry, New Jersey, and they really had a lot of challenges because at that time they were still considered like a tier movie, Mm -hmm. like not a major. Right. But through a lot of going back and forth with the union and the contract, it became a major about a month into pre-production. Okay, Mm. so... It, it was it's was so much like drama going back and forth with the with the union and the production, but we finally got a budget that allowed us to hire amazing crew, not like good crew, like amazing. Mm-hmm. Like uh, the the people who I had were fantastic, and we, you know, we busted it out, you know. Right. But it was. Um, It was a lot of going back and forth between the uh, between the production and the union. And also there was a lot of set decoration and a lot of set pieces up in Canada that were being held up. They couldn't get them across because of the COVID restrictions and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we, we finally got a lot of stuff from uh from canada and when it arrived almost all of it was like unusable you know so we had to start from scratch anyway so anyway it was (laughs) crazy was it the same decorator on both parts to two different no we had um we had all different people Hmm. uh the only personnel were tim and byron werner the um cinematographer oh nice well that consistency helps i mean i didn't i i one thing i noticed i didn't know if you did the casino in the very beginning that's the kiss part so that's was that you i did the um there's really great some really great lighting effects and shadow and the use of red and the use when he does the flashbacks and everything that i thought was really interesting and and you know, you hear when you read when I read flashback or montage in a, in a right. script, I want to kill myself. But right. you know, it's yeah. like so much work for two seconds. <laughs> but you know, but yeah, I did notice lighting effect and and two in the performances when they were, you know, show, showing off these artists, the 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 lighting effects I also thought were really nice and the texture that it Thank gave you. your walls and everything. So I thought that that was really nice. Yeah, so all, we had no locations, zero locations. Everything was built. Really? And, that pulp, that ballroom and everything? Yes. Wow. Bravo. So we had um, a really almost unusable space to build in. Uh, um. the, 
Was it a um, warehouse with uh, no no padding for sound? I've done that. <laughs> oh no, it was completely raw, and <sighs> the warehouse was there had been there's some fault damage in it, and the the floor was was like this, and the 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 gradient in some places was from zero to 24 inches, oh okay? <laughs> so when when I walked in there, and there were cracks in the floor and everything, and, and I, when I walked in, I was like, we, we can't use this, this is unusable. <laughs> and they were like, well, this is all we have because there's a shortage of stage space on the East Coast. There's a, an amazing amount of production, so, uh, production companies take these long leases on production spaces. And so you have HBO in a stage for five years or seven years right, or something right. like that. Right. They don't want to give and it up. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we tried, so I told them we had to construct a deck and it was going to cost a lot. Like they had not planned for that. Um, then they were like, well, are there any other alternatives to floating the deck? And I go, well, you might be able to do a, a cement pour if cement is cheaper to, you know, you can probably pull this out and do a cement pour. So I had cement contractors come in and they were like, you know, the bid, the bid that was coming back was like 300,000, 500,000. Then I had another guy. Well, the building said, owner oh, owner was probably like score. They're gonna yeah, spend all this money so on my goes, my building. Oh, I've been here. I know what's going on. There's another option. We can inject foam underneath and like lift the floor. The problem is there's running water underneath the building, and we have no idea how big the gaps oh, are. Oh my god! So I'm just like, guys, we're building a deck. Yeah. You know, we want it set, we're building a deck. So um, we had... But funny enough that this, who, I, I mean, I don't know if you scouted it before they took a rent on it. I mean, there's... I told them they shouldn't use it. Right, of course I right, it. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, there has to be some sort of like, hey guys, you, you're going to save money here, but we're going to have to spend it here. That constantly Those? happens, constantly. It's a ridiculous yeah. game we play all the time. Yeah, so, yeah, well, that's the that's the conversation. Yeah, and in the end, it was to the to the exact number of what I said the budget was going to be. Like it, like exactly, like not even we we landed exactly oh, where we it. said we were going to be. Um, that's the part that is always, you know, I'm not going to say frustrating, but it's a part of the job that is like, guys, haven't we done this dance before? You know? Well, they have. Can't, they they yeah. all have. Can't, and for, Can't you take my word for it? It's insanity. You know, it, it, doing things repeatedly and, and hoping for a different, different outcome. It's insanity. It's the game of, can this person, I feel it's like, can this person magically do this and just make my problem go away without reality <laughs> interfering yeah. and it's a joke it's a complete yeah. joke that that producers play with the art department all the time i yeah. don't get it i don't but get it but in the end yeah. we built a deck yeah and um we built enormous sets a yeah. ton of micro sets, a ton of changeover sets, live concert performances. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it was um, so ambitious. And I had like nine weeks, you know, to oh, do everything. Really? So I, yeah. I was wondering in some of the scenes, like set extension or like, was there like a round green screen in some of them to give that? We had set extensions. We had a uh, green screen, uh, blue screen. We had ceiling, um, ceiling um, extensions. Like we had the same company that did Mank 
and some mm. other um, company in some other uh, films. Uh, and I had numerous conversations with the post production uh, VFX. Um, we put the audiences into the, you know, into the concerts and um, we recreated exact camera angles of footage that they'd gotten prior. Mm -hmm. So they went to KISS concerts and got co footage and we matched, um, we matched angles and, you know, oh, wow. it's, this is the way. The, it looks the, great. The all, all of it looked great. Like the stadium pieces, I think when the, when him and his father at the track, that looked really great. Like, I was like, oh, this is, this is a Mandalorian shit going on here that <laughs> I gotta ask yeah. him about. Like, it was all like in the round. I thought it was great. It seemed like it. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, um, I, every job, the, the, the post and VFX um, edition, like always gets more and more complete and com complex, you know? And um, at first I was a little, um, I guess, anxious about that idea that these things could be created so easily or whatever. Right. But, you know, I, I found that production designers and art directors and set decorators are still essential because you really do have to interact in a real space. I, on something like a Mandalorian where it's like half set, half extension, or like an avatar where it's some scenes are all, all, yeah. all green or all blue, whatever it, it does to me. Um, I've never, like I just got off of a show that was heavy. I did for all mankind season four, and it's a lot of visual effects. And the, yeah. the designer is constantly talking to them and and everything. But there is um, freedom given to post and and VFX of what the design is going to be in some aspects because they need to create these camera angles out of nothing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you know, not every detail of like a spaceship can be thought out until they see like oh we need something there so there yeah. is the design that the maybe the designer won't be a part of and i i fear that too i fear that too sure. of, of, of set dressing of like not losing the control of losing the control of not being in our theme or in yeah. you know what, what what we had in mind and that's you know yeah. gotta let go <laughs> but <laughs> as a it's designer true. you have more interaction with vfx than a decorator i don't they don't yeah they to don't a talk degree to me. <laughs> you know the the post houses are still pretty territorial you know especially the bigger ones mm. um <clears throat> the smaller ones are happy for whatever assets we could give you know mm. i've i've had um i've had post places where i provided all sorts of assets for them you know where we shot uh, high res images for backgrounds. We did, uh, we did graphics, you know, yeah. uh, paint textures. We would give them high res of paint textures oh, and yeah. things like that. Um, uh, you know, it really, it's a, it's a case by case thing. I mean, you know, most of the time I'm given at least, uh, I can see some of the process where, you know, I could see at least a uh, high res still of what the what the addition might, you know, might right. be or, or what a, uh, a sequence looks like or something. And it's always pretty good. Yeah, they they would come in and um, do like some 3D camera thing in the set to get like demand or they sometimes they would ask me, like, what is the dimension of this box or whatever? So that they can duplicate it or they can, you know, so working hand in hand that way, I appreciate because, you know, I'm still part of it and they're just duplicating our set dressing. I get that. <clears throat> On Spinning Gold, Byron was really into these uh, pre-vis, uh, pre-visualizations. So he had all these shots that were... Um, mapped out in 3d mm. and he would give these like storyboards 
so that saved us a lot of time oh, in that's always helpful. focusing all our energy into certain things. And they went, they really did go by those storyboards very closely. But there were a lot of spur of the moment um, decisions and changes. Did you see the dance Broadway sequence at the oh, end yes. of the movie? Yeah, I love that. So that came about in the last few days of shooting. Tim goes, can we make a Broadway, you know, sure. show oh, set? Sure. I was like, sure. Shoots Friday. Uh, sure. Yes. Question mark. You know, like, yeah, okay. um, so what I did was I, I disassembled part of the set of Casablanca office, linked it to the church, which was mapped out directly across and that, you know, and then brought in all these other set pieces that would just float as, you know, free scenery, you know, right. so a candy store sign, a, you know, a drum set that's just sitting there. Like I just brought in all the key elements and just like placed them and mapped it out so that they could go from this point to this point. And yeah. It, well, and it's very um, imaginative of what he when he's dancing, these little plot points that you're just, you know, visually looking at. It worked really well with like their choreography and the song and everything. No, it was good. I really like that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was great. I mean, probably not great to hear like a week before it shoots, but great visually. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the thing is, is see for me, right? Um, some The director will ask me something like that, right? And my immediate response isn't, yes or no it's let's see you know because yeah. it's dependent on my construction coordinator and my scene yeah. artist and everything else so you know a lot of times i've been on the other end of it where they just decide this yes well without cons consultation well as a decorator i thank you for being like that because there are some designers who just say yes and without like they because although we know what we do like i i can't just pull six guys right now to do this they're out doing returns or like they're right. i don't have the manpower to do this i want to do it i'm in yeah but you know checking with people in your department is always really yeah. nice <laughs> so you know i usually call i call a meeting my art director marie wagner was like a genius like she was really amazing and and i um she made me decide that i would never be an art director again like <laughs> i was like i was like because sometimes you know you're a production designer you art direct yeah. or whatever yeah and i i was like i can't do what you do you're you're the best <laughs> art director I've ever seen. That's and, a fantastic compliment. You know, she, yeah, she was fantastic. And she knew like right off the bat, I'd be like, can we do this Broadway thing? She goes, well, they're going to be dressing this and they're the scenics are doing this and we're still disassembling this and the grips are doing like she just knew all that stuff. And but then she'd go, yeah, I think we could pull it off if we do it this to this and it shoots at this time. And then I would you know, have this conversation with Tim and Byron and they would be like, whatever you say, it's cool. So we had a lot of interdepartmental cooperation, mm. you know, because I would bring in all my department heads for meetings multiple times a day or week to just get a sort of a state of the union about what's happening, oh, you know? Yeah. And you know, that's how I work. I've always worked like that. I'm a scenic painter. I'm, I've built sets. I'm a carpenter. I'm an onset dresser. I've done weapons. I've done props. I've done every job in the art department, basically. Which is and helpful because then you know what to expect from people. <laughs> it, it does help and they feel respected and yes. they feel heard and they feel like they're part of the process. And when you 
ask people for ideas and then you go, that's a great idea. Let's do that. It gives them a sort of a sense of a stake in what we have to do because now it's their idea. I too find it that because if you have done a position, you know what the person is supposed to be doing instead of like, you know, a lot of times people will ask me to do wardrobe or props or something. And I'm like, well, obviously you don't know what I do. So that's cool. But I also read, I think in your bio about being like in sculpting, was that when you were in Italy, right? Yeah. How was that? I studied painting uh, in it at the Academia in in Florence for three years. Oh my God. Uh, Yeah. I, uh, I was, I started out in California as a music major um music composition and i was having a real hard time i was just basically a rock musician self-taught classical i studied a little bit but then i went into music composition and it was really hard and i was struggling because uh i couldn't play piano on the level i needed to and you know it, and it so i just took a drawing class just to get my mind off of things and i've always been an artist as well and I got a lot of encouragement from the art teachers. And I, one thing led to another. I got scholarships. I did really well. And I just switched my major to art. And then the next year, I'm in Italy studying painting, you know? Wow. But you, wait a minute. You, you all of a sudden just started doing art and you were fantastic at it? Like you had never... No, I, I, <laughs> I was always... I was an artist as a kid. Oh, okay. You know, I was really good at drawing and painting. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I played music. And you played music. So, wow. So I, you know, I wanted to go to art school. My father really wasn't into it. So I just kind of bopped around playing in bands and things like that. And then I I went out to California to be a musician. And, you know, one thing led to another um, where... I decided to go back to school. I went back to school at 25. I didn't do college straight in a row. I went to college, did really terribly, and then decided to, you know, go back when I was 25 because I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I have more to accomplish. I think that's smart because then it's really your decision. It's your passion then. I became a top student at right. 25. Right. And, in th- you know, I went to Italy when I was 28. I took the entrance exam to get into the academia, which was eight days long in Italian. And oh it was hard. And I made it in. And, uh, and then I spent uh, three years at the oldest art school in Europe uh. and learned traditional old master's technique. That's and, phenomenal. Uh, That's phenomenal. I would kill for you. that. I would kill for an hour of it. Like, <laughs> that's amazing. It, was, uh, it changed my life, you know? Yeah. And, and the experience probably projects onto all of your projects in some way. Like, you're probably always grabbing from what you've learned there, or, you know. It always so, happens. yes. So one of the things that I... I think I pride myself on as a production designer is I come loaded with a ton of experience, a ton of knowledge of history, literature, art, art history, um, music history. I'm a huge classical person. I worked at tower records classical on sunset for years. (laughs) Um, so I know a lot about certain subjects. So if I get a project that's historical, I can really bring a lot in terms of the, what I, you know, what the validity of the historical aspect of the script is. Mm. Yeah, I did a movie called The Artist's Wife, and I was uh, brought on because of my fine art ability and my and my art history. And I ended up doing all the paintings for the film in addition to designing it. You know? I saw so, that it it was Peter. It was it wasn't Peter O'Toole? It was um, I forget the guy's name now. But I Bruce Stern. Bruce Stern. I was looking at, and then you you have an article on uh, your Facebook page about him and his uh, process for making the movie and everything was fantastic, I thought. 
Oh, it was that that was another project that was really hard, but it was really re rewarding because I was able to create uh, an artistic identity for multiple characters. And I had the director sent the key painting to an art dealer, an mm -hmm. art appraiser, sent an image to it. I wanted Bruce Dern to be a cross between like Franz Klein and Gorky or somebody mm -hmm. like an abstract expressionist. And he sent this painting, which was the key prop for the movie, to his art dealer. And the art dealer goes, this is an amazing painting. It's like a cross between a Franz Klein and like a, a, a Gorky. You know? <laughs> and he, he writes me back like flipping out, you know, that this was these paintings were dead on in terms of the artistic identity of the of the character historically oh my god you know? i'm so, so jealous of your talent i'm so jealous well <laughs> Which... thank you i mean it the thing is is it, what's really amazing is production design allows me to use all the things i know into one job yeah and I stumbled into it, you know, it was one of those things where I, I didn't even know what working on a film was, was like. I, so, well then let's, let me, let me thread that together. So you're in Italy, do you go back to New York and you, and then you like fine artist and then you're painting and then working in TV or film or? So I, uh, I come back from Italy, I get a job in a paint shop doing faux finishes i learn i do marble gilding wood metal so essentially i'm learning all the scenic artist techniques mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then i leave that job and i get a job as an art handler which is uh installing and moving fine art but what i had to do was i had to take down move and reinstall like monumental bronze statues and stuff like that, or marble statues. So it required a certain amount of planning and execution. And so those two things combined into me being able to be a production designer, although I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. And I had a, um, a, a friend who's a cinematographer working on an indie in Brooklyn, and he goes, Hey, you know, you, you might really, you might be pretty good at, at this. It's a sci-fi movie. We're making a lot of robot props and stuff like that. You know, you, you might want to, you know, check it out. Right. So I get a script and I just start breaking it down. I, I didn't know that's what you had to do. I just started writing down the locations and what I thought they would need and all that stuff. And I have a meeting with the director and the director says, this is like exactly what I was thinking. Like, it's like you took w the words from my script and turned it into visual information, which is what Nailed it. production design is. <laughs> so my, my first job in film ever was uh, art director on a feature film. And I, you know, I just... You just did it. You just instinctively knew how to do it. Yeah, but I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, well, along the way, well, I've they... had nightmare jobs. Night, well, yeah. like, <laughs> nightmare. Like, I could tell you a million stories of horrible mistakes, you know? Uh, um, you know, I mean, I, I I could tell you so many, but the the one of the w most is the, uh, the first film I actually production designed was a film that never got released, but it, it's called Zoo. And it has Deborah Harry, David Carradine, Paul Bartel, Paul Sand, Ronnie Spector. Like it's this oh star-studded movie. And it was about a serial killer that killed animals instead of people in this farming community. <laughs> oh, no. And I had to do this scene where... It was a, a, a farm that had been this slaughter, you know, of, of all these animals. So I had the idea to make these uh, scenes look like sacrificial, you know, like have a sort of a supernatural element to it. So I had a lot of taxidermy 
made for this, which was great. But then we worked in a an actual slaughterhouse and the guy and I asked the guy, hey, can you get me like cow skins and, and lamb skins and stuff like that? He goes, oh, yeah, I get you whatever you want. And I was like, OK. And I thought these were going to be like, you know, oh, no. just clean. <laughs> so uh, we're at this. We're at the place at at the set to dress it. And a car comes driving up and it looks like it's at seven. It's coming down a dirt road. And the PA is, you know, driving <laughs> like this and she's freaking out. And she goes, do, do I give you the stuff? And I'm like, yeah. I go around to the back of the car and there's like blood pouring out of the back of the car. Oh, and there's fresh cow skins in plastic bags, okay? And my uh, art department was like, I'm not dealing with that. I'm not touching it. <laughs> yeah, I don't so That's props. <laughs> I, I get these giant acid gloves and I you know, lift these things up and nailing them to like these wooden planks and wooden fences and stuff like that. And it's gruesome. As it, and it was insane. You're lucky Pete and, didn't come and, and nab your ass. <laughs> like, I don't know. Well, don't this know was we like in that. 1997 or 8, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, it, you know, and then the whole, you know, shoot crew comes and as soon as they start rolling, the flies started to come. And oh it was like, God. it was. Well, at least they didn't the, have to pay for that level. They didn't have to pay for flies it, or, or I visual gotta tell effects. You, I really want this movie to be released um, because it's, it sounds really dodgy, but it was, it was a, a kind of a dark comedy. It's a very cult I you could know, see that. Kind of thing. I could see that and going that way. <laughs> it's got insane sequences in it. But at that time, I was dressing sets myself, even right. though I was the production designer. Yeah. So, you know, I mean. You just do. I, I mean, if you're on, if you're, you know, you're working and you're, everybody's got to dig in and get it done. You know, hopefully the production designer helps out too. I don't like it. I don't like it when I see the designer doing stuff or like helping like don't you know you're embarrassing me in a sense but if there's no one else around and I'm, I'm appreciative of you helping me <laughs> like, that's how I think <laughs> I um I just learned on the job you know yeah. I learned through trial and error and as I gained more experience I gained a little more confidence and I yeah. found that you really have to have a great team and you have to have really good communication and you have to be able to <clears throat> head off problems before they begin. You, you know, yeah. once you're in a problem, it becomes stressful, like with every second that passes because it's impacting the schedule, it's impacting everything. Yeah. So you have to get to the point where you can see these things and communicate them before they happen yeah. you know yeah try to try to get your magic ball out and anticipate things that you know might not go so well but um in spinning gold and the different performances that you had for like donna summer and parliament and i mean were you just watching so much footage to try to you know get a i mean obviously you know the you know the vibe. We all kind of know the vibe, but to yeah. visually get that. Yes. Was that I watched I had tons of archival footage. I took frames uh and printed them mm. and we uh worked on specific for example the KISS instruments, I knew what those instruments were going to be. Mm -hmm. And I called Gibson guitars and got those instruments. And because I was a musician, right. I knew exactly what I needed. And I had these conversations from an educated point of view. And I was able to get a lot of authenticity in certain things. And then some things were really just created because this was really like, a fantasy slash memory of of Neil Bogart's confession or right. or whatever of how this uh, how this whole story unfolded. So we did have like a magical realism element to it. We did have a lot of 
fantasy elements to it where, you know, certain things were implausible, but we allowed it. You know, we tried to stay uh, faithful to the historical aspect of certain things that fans were going to really call us out on. Right, right. I mean, I just kept thinking, because I just listened to Kiss on Howard Stern, of how much they have marketed their whole world and how that comes up in the movie too about the marketing mm-hmm. of kiss and everything and i was wondering if like because you have the kiss sign in the back which is like their font it's their thing i did i was wondering like clearance wise like was was that a burden was that so, like some things we were able to clear and some things we could we couldn't trans we couldn't clear <clears throat> their makeup we hmm. couldn't clear their costumes Um, I couldn't clear the logo either. So what we did was we made alterations to them that would fit within the scope of what was allowed that wouldn't violate a copyright. Um, And we also had some early source material from Joyce Bogart's notebooks and sketches of prototypes of... proposed costumes yeah. and proposed makeups. Wow. That's a gem. That's, yeah. That's amazing. So, so we were able to get close because this is leading up to Kiss's big right. release, right? It sort of peaks with the recording of Kiss Alive, which was their big breakout that brought all their real fans to them and turned them into record-selling superstars at that time they couldn't sell any records you know uh and so we were able to take a certain amount of license with making this kiss finding their way i i had no idea about like i i know of kiss i don't really know the that story i had no idea about donna summer being like a single mom, I'm assuming in Germany, I think it was, and like mm-hmm. being, you know, re-recording that song to uh, to the times to make it, you know, more disco, more funky, everything. I found that completely fast. The Gladys Knight thing, like I can't wait for my parents to actually watch this movie. <laughs> They're gonna cool. love it. They're gonna love it. But I thought, as a character, and watching them age him was interesting, also. But it was also in your design of like the innocence of that uh, drugstore to like the more grittiness or uh, of like the Buddha recording studio or his his office and how your color. I feel like your color palette changed throughout Mm -hmm. throughout his life. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. So I have to give a shout out to Michelle La Liberté, who was the designer in Canada, mm. okay? So she did the drugstore and Buddha Records, right? Mm. So that's her, that's... everything leading up. Oh, and right. so I did from that point forward. So you can see right. that mark is what separates it, is that that's clearly where I went off to create the later part, right. you know, because... Right. It, it is that was the focal point of when Buddha Records turned into Casablanca Records. So I took over from there, and we wanted to have a clear shift, yeah, um, from those two halves of of Neil Bogart's life, which is basically what that is. He yeah. moves to New York. He meets Joyce. You know, and and all that is. It was essentially two scripts, okay? Like, I got sent a script that was, I I don't know, man. I think it might have been, I think it might have been 200 pages. Like, it was a really long script, (laughs) but they had shot, we weren't going to shoot all of it because they had shot a large chunk of what was already done. So what I got was the second half of the movie, essentially, Mm, right? mm -hmm. Even though how it's edited, you know, it plays back and forth and it's intermixed and things like that. But it's, it's a story in two halves. And Michelle Liberté did really the early stuff 
where he's a singer, you know, he's like a pop singer. He's right. trying to be a teen idol, you know, he's, and his early naive beginnings, uh, what a that life. was her, you know. What a life. What a, like, changing his name three, four times, like being a singer, then a record producer, like, what an incredible career. And so sad because he, he dies fairly young. Yeah, and, and what 39. Could have, yeah, what could, what could have been. Did you have to, because you said you build everything, did you have to rebuild anything? Yes. So what happened was we were to get um, a bunch of set material from Canada. And I was waiting on this stuff because I needed it for certain things. Um, but what came was severely damaged, disassembled with a sawzall or something, <laughs> uh, unlabeled, unorganized. So we did have to um, we did have to rebuild and augment uh, sets that were coming in. And then what we did was we reused set material to create uh, the Joyce's apartment, for example. Mm. You know, like we would just be like, I, I'd be like, I don't care, just reface these flats with brick. You know, right, like right. let's. Let's just take this out. It's the recording studio. I don't give a shit. Add this over here. Right. Let's put a loft up here, you know, and the recording studio is now Joyce's apartment. Yeah, such a little love nest here. she had. Such a little Yeah, thing. and, you know, see, this. the thing is, is I did, those were the sets that were, I didn't have to refer to anything historical, and I didn't have to reinvent the wheel on that. You know, it, it wasn't like I needed to design something so complex to tell a story. I used the set decorator to do that. Yeah, it was really layered, really nicely layered and like thank you. period and Trisha, like really great. I thought her Trisha was great. Peck it was yeah. is her name. And she she um, really came through like I everything I asked she got everything I needed she did um, her crew were fantastic and I did say I wanted a few things in there like I said I want a bunch of airline bags they used to have these airline oh, yeah, like the TWA you know, and like the Pan, right. Pan Am I, I want it to seem like that she's traveled a lot and she keeps getting these bags like put a bunch of bags there give me a give me like a, a an art station here where she's working on drawings and crap like that you know yeah. like so you know it was really easy for that that type of stuff you know like that 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 wasn't the hard part the hard parts were doing a water gag with a live, you know, the the the, the sprinklers come down. Oh, yeah, the, on the camera. All right? <laughs> yeah. You know, the, Tim's like, okay, so we want to have a sprinkler. I'm like, that's a 1974 Gibson Flying V that's going to get completely soaked, you know. Yeah. This is a Change your drum angle. set, a pearl <laughs> drum set that's going to get waterlogged. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, and then it was also... Um, the stage we were building in didn't have any drainage. So what I had to do was oh. create a sort of a pool with a liner that was just hanging over the whole thing. And then we floored over that and then we would lift up the platform and then we would vacuum out the water. But oh. uh, I said, I told them, you know, there's a limit to how many times this could be done. And they were like, it doesn't matter. We're going to let the sprinklers run. We don't give a shit. But I had to make sure that the other sets didn't get flooded. Well, yeah. You know? I mean, they're only thinking in their one shot. They got to, you got to think ahead. You got to think about how it's going to affect even all the set dress. I that What I think is like, oh, oh, well, that was a rent. If that was a rental, that sucks. Like all those nice chairs and everything. <laughs> we, you know, we, what we did was we knew they were all going to get wet. So what we did was we, we had, um, we replaced the pads. I had pads made, for example, and we got all our own linen stuff. Yeah. And, you know, we, we knew that was always the case. We knew the carpet was going to be a throwaway. We knew right. the, you know, so, um, but it was, 
also we didn't want a mold situation to develop because it was very hot in the studio in the place we were shooting Mm -hmm. you know there was it was a warehouse so there wasn't air conditioning and then when you have wet you know uh flats and things like that you run the risk of mold starting to come so we had to All of these things you have to think of as a production designer and art department of like, yeah, Yeah. we can do that. But the reality is (laughs) you we got then we got a bunch of what water's heavy, by the way, (laughs) and coordinating that with special effects. Like we got the thing is, is that Tim and Tim really wasn't like oblivious to any of that. And if you see the way his father did business, like Tim was sort of the same way in terms of doing the movie. Like he was always like, we can, we can do it. We can figure it out. Like it's, it's okay. We'll, we'll deal with that. Those type of people are great. They're great. (laughs) You know, we, we had a great relationship. I really, you know, it was very stressful at times, but it was also very, it was built on an excitement of creative ideas, Yeah. you know? And how, I mean, just I would think too. If you're if you're in this project and he's being a part of it, you want it to be well done. And you you're, he's telling the story of his father. I mean, you have to give it your all. The passion for him has got to be unbelievable. I was honored that he trusted me, you know, so much, and he believed in me. He really did. He was. Um, he was always really happy with yeah. everything oh, that's like awesome. overjoyed actually when he saw the kiss footage of the Cobo hall concert he he called me up like in the middle of the night he was like dude i i just put our footage next to the real footage <laughs> and it's fucking dead on i was like dude i'm so happy right now Thank oh my you. god that's you know? fantastic that's fantastic yeah. that makes it all worthwhile uh, it was a great experience. Uh, I mean, it was hard. It, I'm not going to lie. It was it was brutal, to be honest. But it was also, we knew what we were getting. We knew that the stuff we were getting was fantastic. Like the whole mirror, the dancing mirror. Oh, I love thing, that. You know? I love that scene, the Donna Summer scene. Oh, my God, I love it. We created this mirror camera rig, okay, with, and, and these these mirrors on wheels and so it's a it's a mobile house of mirrors that yeah and this was also done very um improvisationally you know we we were did you build we those? had to test did you build those or were they rented? we built all of you yeah built we those. built all of them. yeah uh-huh That's right. and and we had to we had to test various um two-way glass Mm. You know, because some of them were not going to be translucent enough, transparent enough. And and some were going to have we're not going to allow for the camera to do certain things. So we we had a um, we had a a variety of tests. Mm -hmm. We also had to create these uh, rigs because when you have a mirror this high, the base has to be a certain width because you will, they'll be top heavy. So when they're spinning around and going around in a circle on a stage, you don't want to run the risk of them tipping over. So you have to have a certain center of gravity, a certain weight. They have to be easy for a dancer to move as well as camera to be able to sit on. You know, we had cameras sitting on, one of them it's such a choreographed around. motion of the camera and people moving the mirrors and she's donna summer's like sitting in the chair it's really it's a it's and i love too that they brought her daughter in you know like always having her daughter around really like brought it down to a relatable i thought sense of like why she's doing all this and you know i just thought it was great great little just a great little detail I thought that ties people in emotionally to what Donna Summer's process was. I thought, I don't know. I did. (laughs) I loved it. (laughs) It's a gem. The whole, the whole movie is a gem. I was watching. I was, I was, you know, I couldn't, what I did like and then not like a little bit was I liked that the music 
wasn't exactly Gladys Knight singing that song. It was this artist version mm-hmm. of it, or like this art, or Jason Derulo, like all of these artists who are playing these other people and their interpretation of these songs, I thought too was like, that's so smart. That's so smart to have that. So you're not exactly like uh, replicating but you're yeah. giving it your own spin and like you said before it's his own version of of this like a dream sequence or a memory or whatever so mm-hmm. yeah that's fantastic i thought it was thank great. you yeah i loved it <laughs> i'm so glad to get to see it <laughs> thank you i'm coming out to la for the premiere on the, i'll be there next week oh it's fantastic the, it's at the dga so we're oh. having a screening there so i'll be out So I hope you enjoyed that because I found it so fascinating how, I mean, John was a musician and then a fine artist. I mean, in Italy, that is an experience of a lifetime, I gotta say. I'm so jealous. I mean, you gotta be talented to, you know, be accepted and go to school over there and, and, you know, have all that. And I also think it's really important how he was saying that he's been everything. He's... He has decorated on small films. He's been a scenic. He's done everything. So always don't forget that that experience helps you in every position you have um, in the art department. It's it's all valuable. You won't regret. You won't regret it. Um, but yeah, such a pleasure to speak with him and and to meet him. You know, it's one of the nice things. I try to stay in touch with a lot of the people I get to meet on this podcast, and so. It's really nice always to um, just be familiar with other people who I wouldn't have the opportunity to without without this little podcast. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. And congratulations on the film. It's wonderful. If anyone can catch it, it's not, it's, you know, it's good. Uh, what do I got for you? So next week, I have production designer Maya Siegel, who production designed the Apple Plus uh, series Hello Tomorrow, which I've told you about, and I've told probably everyone about, because I think it's just very innovative, and the design I love, and super excited for you to hear the interview of all of the sets that they did, they did for the whole season, and um, I actually had to postpone her releasing her episode, because I wanted to talk about the whole season, and so I talked to her like almost two months ago, or a month and a half ago, so been waiting to release that to you. I have production designer Catherine Edder from the series BMF, Black Mafia Family, and um, Hellraiser, the new innovative of, uh, innovation of Hellraiser that came out a year or so ago. So yeah, that was a good one, made me watch Hellraiser. I have production designer Clarence Major, production designer Jordan Ninkovich, production designer James Bartle. I mean, I got I got a lot coming up. And then I have a slew, slew of Emmy contenders that I am booking. Booking up, people. And um, some, some good stuff there. Uh, what else? Um, follow on Instagram, TikTok. Um, sign up on the website for the email that comes out every week that I do of who's coming on the program that would be cool if you did that and the coolest thing you got to do this week besides uh you know represent your holiday is um you know just rate and review rate and review this little podcast and um you'll be happy about it i'm sure you will i hope you got an earful i'm kim one up for decorating pages Welcome to Pro Tips for the Pros, brought to you by Floor and Decor Bailey's Crossroads. In this series, we'll explore essential advice for professional contractors to deliver outstanding renovation results. Let's dive in. Keep the work area clean and organized throughout the renovation process to create a positive impression and minimize stress for the customer. Regularly clean up debris and dust to maintain a safe and comfortable living environment. Thank you for joining us for this pro tip on planning thorough renovations. Stay tuned for more expert advice brought to you by Floor and Decor Bailey's Crossroads. A lot of people tolerate ordinary. 
ordinary bathrooms, kitchens, entryways. Well, not on your watch. If you're a pro, you've got a new partner in town. Floor and Decor. From tile to wood to stone, Floor and Decor has more styles and job lock quantities of Schluter, Mape, Ladacrete, and other brands pros trust. Come see a whole new way to wow with Floor and Decor. Coming soon to Bailey's Crossroads.